Good morning. It is good to see you this morning. Uh, we're continuing our sermon series, Elements of Worship. Um, last week, Pastor Chris talked about the element of worship of praise. Um, we, we talked about the fact that we worship God through things like song, that we praise Him. I would venture to say that most of you didn't have to be told that. Um, when we sing, we, we call our songs worship songs, right? Um, it's kind of normal, but worship extends beyond just the songs that we sing. And this morning, we're going to look at it from the lens of we worship through the prayers that we pray. And so we're going to unpack a passage here this morning because with music, this isn't the case for me. Actually, Pastor Chris and I were at a conference this week, and we were joking around about the fact that, like, neither of us are musical. And, like, people around us are going crazy, and they, they come to this point where it's like, okay, everybody clap and sing, right? Right? And I'm either clapping or I'm singing. I'm not doing both because I can't. Like, I'm sitting there. Yeah, we, we're both sitting there like watching the guy in front of us so we could clap on beat, but then we're not singing. It, it's crazy. But many of you have musical talents. You don't have to be taught how to sing. But it's interesting. So many times I hear people say, uh, you want me to pray? I, I don't know how to pray. And so this morning we're going to look and learn from the master teacher, from Jesus Christ on how we should pray. Go ahead and open up your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6. I'm just going to pray to kick off this morning just because I know it's been a crazy week for me. And so I just am going to pray and ask that God would speak this morning to our hearts. God, you are good. You are so good, and we worship you for that. God, I pray that this morning that the words would not be my words, but your words. God, that as your word is given that our hearts would be inclined to love you more today than we did yesterday. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Do any of you maybe have a friend who like wants to be really great at something? They, they want to be so great. Of course, this is a friend. You would never do this. Um, but you, you know somebody who it's like, I want to be so great at something that I will spend all the money in the world to get the best equipment because that's what will make me great. Like, you know what I'm talking about? Like, somebody who will, like, refinance their house just to get something so they can be the best at it. Like, they think that equipment will make them the best. Or, or the person that will, like, max out a whole bunch of credit cards so they can get the right stuff because then they will be great. Um, I know people that have done that before, um, and if I'm being honest, I think I've done this before too. Um, but but the, these people who it's like, um, yeah, so I'm going to buy that Gibson guitar because then I can play like John Lennon. Yeah. Or, or that kid, you know, you know that, that kid who he saves up his allowance for the entire year so he can buy the new Air Jordans so he can dunk from the free throw line. Well, okay, maybe not dunk from the free throw line, but maybe get more than the 30 seconds of playing time at the end of a blowout because his coach sees him sitting on the bench and feels bad for him. So he gets those Air Jordans, like, yeah, now I'm going to be good to go. Like I said, I, I think I can relate to doing this um, at different times in my life. We recently moved down to North Carolina, if you haven't noticed that already. And one thing that I have been introduced to since moving down here is crappy fishing. Not, not crappy like this is lousy fishing. Crappy fishing as in like the type of fish, all right? So, so they have these fish that are called crappies. And I've never fished for crappies before. But I moved down here with Anna, and I'm introduced to crappy fishing, and I'm hooked. See what I did there? Yeah, there you go. You're awake. You're awake. So, so I'm introduced to crappy fishing, and I'm thrilled about this. Anna is like, you're going what? You're doing that again? come on, like, really, is it that fun? And I'm like, yeah, it really is that fun. Um, so I go out on the boat uh, with these guys. Different guys in the church have taken me out, and I'm thankful for it. Um, it's, been, it's been a great experience, even just getting to know other people in the church. So if, if you want, like, find somebody in the church that does something that you're interested in, you get to know them better. It's great. Uh, and that's a whole side story. But anyways, so we go out, and and we're crappy fishing, right? So, so they give me this rod and reel, and, and well, I brought my stuff, and they're like, no, don't, 
you can't fish crappies with that stuff. I'm like, oh, okay, I didn't know that. So, so they give me a rod and reel, and I'm like, all right, cool. Um, we go out, <clears throat> and we find a hole, and they start, we start jigging. That's what they call it, jigging. I'm, I've never jigged for anything in my life. So I'm jigging. I'm crappy jigging. And, and like, literally, I mean, I couldn't get any closer to where their line is without, like, having my rod on theirs. And, and they're fishing, and I'm watching. I'm like, are you kidding me? I'm getting frustrated because I'm sitting here as the rookie, as a transplant from Pennsylvania, and I want to catch fish, and all I'm doing is watching them catch fish. I could have stayed at home and turned on, like, YouTube channel and watched people catch fish. I'm like, what in the world? So I'm a pretty smart person from time to time. So you know what I did? I said, hey, where'd you get that rod? Uh, what about that reel? I'm, I'm literally, I kid you not, I take out my smartphone and I'm taking pictures of everything. The rod, the reel, the jig, the jig head, like the color, the paint color. And you know what I did? I said, hey, why don't you go ahead and order me one of those rods? Yeah. So, see if I can actually work it here. So, don't worry, I'm not going to try to catch any of you. None of you are that crappy, all right? So, anyways, I'm like, yo, and I already got it hooked on the carpet. That, that's what happens. I catch the boat. Oh, great. Well, that might have to stay there. <laughs> Sermon illustration gone wrong. So this is going to stay here the rest of the morning. But anyways, true story, this happens to me on the boat. It's terrible. Like, I catch my lunchbox, I catch the rope. You have to take a lunchbox when you go out crappy fishing with these guys because you're out all day. But anyways, I'm like, yo, get me this rod and reel because then I'll be able to catch fish like you, right? I get the right equipment, I'm good to go. So I'm just going to lay this over here so I don't hurt anyone, including myself. And so I ordered this rod and reel. I was like, yo, can you get that for me? And next time we go out, they hand me that rod and reel. I got the jig heads. I painted them myself just like theirs. And we start fishing again. And I watched them fish. I was like, what is going on? You see, what makes them great at fishing isn't necessarily the tools that they have. What, what made Jordan great at basketball wasn't that he had the right shoes. I mean, he designed the shoes. Like, he got to design them. What made John Lennon great at music wasn't the guitar in his hands. It was something inside. It was the intangibles that made him great. Sometimes we see spiritual growth the way that people see skills growth. We think that if we have the right tools, we fool ourselves into thinking like, I'll be a better Christian if I do certain things the right way. And while we need those tools, our relationship with Jesus is directly tied not to those tools, but to our love for Jesus. Prayer is not a quick quick fix tool to make us a super Christian. Rather, it's an element of worship that reflects our heart. Jesus knew that there were certain people that had the right tools, but they didn't have that right relationship. And so he says this in Matthew chapter 6, starting in verse 5. When you pray, don't be like the hypocrites who love to pray publicly on street corners and in the synagogues where everyone can see them. I tell you the truth, that is all the reward they will ever get. But when you pray, go away by yourself, shut the door behind you, and pray to your Father in private. Then your Father who sees everything will reward you. When you pray, don't babble on and on as people of other religions do. They think that their prayers are answered merely by repeating their words over and over again. Don't be like them. For your Father knows exactly what you need, even before you ask Him. We just read part of the Sermon on the Mount. This sermon was all about what it means to be a real follower of Jesus Christ. Um, we're familiar with parts of this, right? Like Jesus is here and he is saying some radical, radical things. Jesus is saying things like, um, yeah, blessed are the humble. They'll inherit the whole earth. He says, um, if you even look at a woman with lust, you've already slept with her in your heart. He says things like, um, yeah, your enemy, love him, do good to him, and even pray for him. This is radical. This is totally different than what these people were used to hearing. 
He teaches a completely different system, and he continues that as he teaches about prayer. And Jesus launches into his discussion about prayer with the use of a negative illustration, actually two of them. It'd be like this. Um, so hanging out with some of the, the kids in stage two, the cross point kids stage two, um, some of the guys, they love playing basketball. And say that I was going to teach them how to play basketball. Pastor Chris, can you stand up real quick? I would, it would be like this. I would say, um, kid, you see that guy right there? You don't want to play like him. He's a wannabe, and that's a what not to be, all right? Because this is what happened. You play like him, then when you're, well, when you're a lot older, the only person you're able to beat is a seventh grader, all right? So, so go ahead and have a seat. Thank you. I don't have a job on Monday, so if anybody's looking for work, my cell phone number or email, you can just reach out to me. That'd be great. Um, but Jesus is, is launching, and he's saying, look, this is what not to do. And he, and he talks about these different people. And the first example is who he calls the hypocrites. He's talking about the Pharisees. He's talking about the religious leaders of that day. And he says, don't be like them. Why? Because this is what they do. They have this thinking that if I go into public places and I pray these really eloquent prayers, like I use these really great words, I use the these and the thous, then God will love me more and, and people are going to like me more. But Jesus says, no, all they really get is a pat on the back, and that's it. And it's useless. Second example, he says uh, other religions or Gentiles, people who were heathens, they didn't worship God. And he says, don't be like them either because this is what they do. They go and they, they pray these prayers with these magical phrases that they repeat over and over and over again to their make-believe gods thinking, then I'll get what I want. And Jesus says, don't pray like these guys. Why? Because their worship was misdirected. The Pharisees were worshiping themselves by getting people to pat them on the back, by, by looking really good. The Gentiles were worshiping themselves by praying to gods that they made in their own image. It was completely me-focused, completely self-focused. So then, how are we supposed to pray? What, what are we supposed to do? Jesus says that being a real Christian is not buying the right equipment. It's about the intangible, intangibles. You see, following him boils down to a heart that worships him. And Jesus is going to teach his disciples how to pray by teaching them the posture of prayer. So as we go through this, I want to unpack the words, but the words reflect the heart. Notice the heart of prayer that Jesus teaches. Look closely as we read through this, and then we'll work through it together. It says this in verse 9. Pray like this. Our Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come soon. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today the food we need, and forgive us our sins as we have forgiven those who sin against us. And don't let us yield to temptation, but rescue us from the evil one. So there's this prayer, and this prayer is the mixing of the extraordinary and the ordinary. It's a prayer for both the majestic and for the mundane. It's a, a, a lofty and yet lowly prayer. It mixes eternal and temporal. It's for both the spiritual and the physical. And so we start with the beginning where it says, where we see just simply pray the extraordinary. The first three requests talk about praying the extraordinary. And the first extraordinary is that we pray for God's honor. Um, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. How many of you grew up learning that prayer, the Lord's Prayer, and you said that, um, and maybe when you were a kid you said, hallowed be your name. How many, did anybody, am I the only one who thought it said hallowed? Really? Oh, okay, there's at least a couple that are honest, all right? You can be honest, we're in church. So, so I grew up, and it's like, hallowed be your name? Like, what does that mean? Like, I'm a little kid, and, and the old English, like, it just doesn't jive with me because we're in a different era. Um, but our modern translations do a great job unpacking what this means. Uh, the Old English word hollow means to reverence, to praise as sacred. In Greek, this word literally means to dedicate, to make holy or honor as holy. 
And so our modern translation reads this, may your name be kept holy. That's how the prayer starts. It's Jesus says, look, when you start your prayer, start like this. God, make me learn to honor your name as holy. God, make people all over this world honor your name as holy. You see, Jesus is teaching first and foremost the posture of our prayer. Because this first line is going to shape everything that comes after it. Do you see the focus of this prayer? Jesus is taking a magnifying glass and zooming in on one name, and it's God. Because our tendency, often our focus of prayer is is to belittle God and make much of ourselves. Or we magnify God as long as he gives us what we want him to give us. But Jesus is saying, no, 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 no. Prayer is all about worship. It's all about God and his name. So then the, the second extraordinary is this, not just God's honor, but then God's rule. God, we want your name to be honored everywhere, so show your reign as king. And the truth of the matter is that someday this will be the case. In fact, look at these verses with me. It says this in, in Philippians chapter 2. It says, therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. His name will someday be honored by all people, whether willingly or by force, every knee will bow at the name of Jesus someday. And then check out this in Revelation Chapter 17, it says, Together they will go to war against the the Lamb, but the Lamb will defeat them because He is Lord of all lords. He is King of all kings. And His called and chosen and faithful ones will be with Him. Someday, God's rule will rule the earth. And He will be King over everything. But currently, we live in the right now. We live in today. We live in a world of chaos where injustice is starving fellow citizens so certain people can maintain power. We live in a world of chaos where poverty cripples the hopes of kids dreaming for something better. We live in a world of chaos where natural disasters destroy life. We live in a world of chaos where where brokenness sells women into slavery. And so we cry out. We cry out to God and say, God, in order for your name to be honored, please, God, demonstrate your kingship. Demonstrate your sovereign rule over this world and in my heart so that people see who you are, that you're king of kings and lord of lords. We pray for this relief now, but... But really, our hope is in what's yet to come. That someday God is going to recreate the heavens and the earth, and he is going to rule his kingdom perfectly. And so we wait for that day. So we pray for God's honor, we pray for God's rule, but then also we pray for God's will to be done. This is the next extraordinary thing. It says that your will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. This kind of implies two things. One, it implies that God's will is perfectly being done in heaven, but that it's not on earth. And before you you claim me a heretic, let me explain this. There's God's will, and then there's God's moral will. And I believe this is talking about God's moral will, that, that here on earth, his will isn't executed perfectly because sin exists. Because sin exists in our lives, even as believers. And so we frustrate God's will by by giving in to sinful desires because God's will is that we would be like Jesus Christ. God's will is that the church would act like the church, but we don't always do that. You see, God's will isn't cryptic. It's not mystical. It doesn't need deciphered. His will is simply this, that the church, well, that everyone, but especially those who are saved, would live like they're saved, that they would live like Jesus Christ. Look at this in Romans uh, chapter 8. It says, for God knew his people in advance, and he chose them to become like his son. 
that his son would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. For God's will to be done on earth as it is in heaven, it's a call for us as a church, us as saved people, to live like saved people. It's a call for us to live like Christ, to be like Christ. And so we, we call out to Jesus, we pray with Jesus, God, as the angels in heaven carry out your all good and all wise will in heaven, help us as your church to carry out your will in this world. To love you and to love our neighbors as ourselves. So this is the breathtaking part of prayer. This is the majestic and the lofty part of prayer. It's the eternal things, the kingdom things, the heavenly things, and they enrich and enhance our view and our perspective of life. It's more than just the here and now. But we're also instructed to pray for the ordinary things. We pray for things like our provisions. Jesus teaches his disciples to pray that God would meet their needs to survive. It says, give us today the food we need. Give us the things we need to survive. This is a very baseline, ordinary prayer. But it's still in there. Because here's the thing. It still postures us in honor to God, because to ask for the needs to survive, it shows our own weakness and frailty. That we're dependent on God providing these things for us. We enter into God's throne room saying, God, I'm weak and I am needy. And so God, please give me what I need for a healthy body and for a healthy mind. We pray for the ordinary by our provisions, but also our forgiveness. You see, Life is more than physical. Life is also relational. So we pray that, that God would help us in our relationships, our relationship with him. It takes humility and honesty to come before God and confess our sins and say, God, I've sinned against you. Please, will you forgive me? And we know that God will forgive us because he hung his son on the cross to free us from our sins. Because our sin burden is too much for any of us to bear. Our guilt is too much for any of us to bear. And so Christ says, when you go and you pray, pray and ask God to forgive you. But it doesn't stop there. It says, as we forgive other people. You see, we we not only ask God for his mercy to forgive us, we ask God for his grace so we can go and reciprocate this. So we can go and forgive other people. So his will can be done on earth as it is in heaven. He is forgiving us. Now we go forgive them. And so we come and we pray and we call out to God, God, forgive me the sins I commit daily. And you will forgive me because you nailed your son to the cross that I might be free from sin and bondage. But now, Lord, help me extend that forgiveness to others. Why? So that your name can be honored our provisions, our forgiveness, but then also our growth. Finally, we ask for deliverance from temptations and from evil. You see, God's forgiveness is not motivation to keep sinning. It's a motivation to stop sinning. It's not, hey God, that last request, as far as you forgive me, since you're always going to forgive me, um, I can just keep going and, and sinning. No, Christ says, look, as you're praying this prayer, The last thing is, deliver us from evil. Deliver us from temptations. Help me to grow to be more like Jesus Christ. You see, we come before God at this last petition, and we say, God, your forgiveness is abundant. But do not let me keep sinning. God, show me how to escape temptations, how not to give in to Satan, so that I can be a good testimony for you. So your name is honored. So your name is kept holy. You see, prayer is worship. Hallowed be your name. May your name be honored. And this motivates everything else that Jesus teaches about prayer. God, it's all about you. I pray to make more of God, not to make more of me. And so our prayer goes something like this. God, let your glory capture my heart, my passions, and my desires. And to that end, I ask that you would stop things like oppression, poverty, disasters, and injustice. 
God, for the sake of your name, help the church be the church. God, in order to help me remember how awesome you are and how needy I am, provide my daily needs. God, you're holy and I am not. And so I ask for your forgiveness and I ask for your power to help me forgive other people. And then God, let your forgiveness in my life motivate me to grow to be more like Jesus. God, above everything else, magnify your name. May your name be kept holy. But one thing that's often an issue when it comes to prayer is this question. Are my prayers even being heard? Do my prayers even matter? In this chapter, if you look down just a few verses to verse 32 and 33, Jesus commands his followers not to be anxious. And there's a common theme between why he says they shouldn't be anxious, why we shouldn't pray like those guys, and how we're supposed to pray. And it's this phrase, our Father in heaven. Don't be anxious because your Father already knows what you need. Don't pray like them because your Father in heaven already knows. There's this theme, and this theme is vitally important. I don't know what kind of dad you did or didn't have. I love my dad. He was a great father. And my dad wanted to do whatever he could do for me. Like when I asked him, like, hey, dad, can we do this? Dad, can I get that? He did whatever he possibly could. But the reality is my dad's a human being, and he had limitations. He had limited resources. He had limited time. And so he did the best he could, but he couldn't do everything. But you know what? God is limitless. God, our Father, where? Not on this earth, in heaven. There is no limits with God because his power rests in his power executed in creating the entire universe. Nothing is too much for God. So do our prayers matter? Are they even heard? I want to tell you this morning, no matter where you're at, no matter how many times you've cried out and said, God, please, and it seems like there's no answer, Know this, God, your Father in heaven, hears your prayers. So what's the big idea? What's the main point that I'm trying to get out this morning? It's this. We don't pray so that God loves us. God loves us, so we pray. And This is a big shift in our thinking, and I want to unpack this because we don't pray so God loves us. I can't, I mean, there might be some of you who think, okay, um, the tool of prayer, I need that to be better, right? So, So if I pray more, God's going to love me more. Maybe some of you think that. I would venture to say most of you don't, at least not intentionally. But we kind of default to this because the next step in that is, okay, God, I'm going to pray so that you love me more. And if you love me more, you're going to give me what I ask for. I bet you most of us can identify with this. We think, if I do the right Christian things, then God's blessing comes into my life. And part of that's understandable. That's how the Old Testament system worked. The nation of Israel did well. God blessed them. If they did bad, God cursed them. But we live in a new covenant. We live under the rule and reign of Jesus Christ. Our relationship to God is directly contingent upon our relationship with his son, Jesus, whether we're his child or not. You see, what happens is when we pray so that God loves us, when we pray so that God answers our prayer, then we get upset when he doesn't answer it exactly how we want it. It's like, uh, God, I've been praying for this for so long, and, and you didn't answer this. God, God. I was praying for this loved one, and they still passed away. I mean, this rocks people's faith. People walk away from the faith because they're like, God wasn't big enough to answer this prayer. But the posture of prayer is then, it's all about me. God, you didn't answer my will. My will was not done. You see the difference here? So we don't pray so that God loves us. God loves us, 
so we pray. You see, when we come to God in this posture, then whatever he does or doesn't do, we say, God, you're awesome, and I trust you. And so even though it hurts and it grieves my heart to see this person pass away, for me to lose my job, for this to be an issue that my child is struggling with, God, I'm going to trust you. Because, God, I know that you love me, and so whatever you're doing is for my best interest. And for that, I'm going to keep praying. And I'm going to keep praying that your name, not my name, your name is honored above everything else. You see, I didn't have more fish on my plate at the fish fry because I had the right rod, the right reel, the right jig. In fact, I actually had more fish on my plate because these guys were gracious and gave me all the fish that they were catching. Um, so my wife and I could actually eat some fish. It was great. We don't have a better relationship with God simply because we pray. We have a right relationship with God because we live for the honor and glory of his name. Because we say, God, I'm helpless. I'm a sinner, and I need your son, Jesus Christ, to save me from my sins. And because I know you love me so much that you sent your son to die for me, then, God, I'm going to pray to you. And I'm going to pray that your will is done, that your rule is evidence that my needs, not my wants, are met, that you would continue to forgive me, that you would help me grow. And I pray all of this so you become famous. So your name is made holy. So you are honored. So here's the take home. This week, go and pray. And when you pray, think about how you pray. What are you praying for? Are you more focused on the ordinary? If so, I want to challenge you to stop praying so God loves you and start realizing that God loves you and that's why you're praying. To shift your thinking because we tend to default to the ordinary. That's like the here and now. We can see this stuff. But God wants us to pray for both the extraordinary and the ordinary and all of it is for his name. So this week, go and pray. Pray the Lord's Prayer, both the extraordinary and the ordinary, both the big and the small. We've been passing out these prayer cards and the intention of that is to mix both. Things like God's will to be done. Um, things like social injustices, God's rule to be, to be shown on this earth. But then even just ordinary things like health, physical needs, financial needs, provisions. So go and pray this prayer this week that God would be honored even beyond your world, even beyond your circle of influence. One way you can do this is by downloading this app. Um, it's Voice of the Martyrs. Pray today. Um, if you want, I will encourage you to take out your phones. If it's going to happen by taking out your phone right now, then take out your phone right now and download this app. And each and every day, it gives a prayer request. Pray for such and such. The, one, the world prayers, some of them are coming straight from this app. And every single day, it gives you a prayer request. It says, pray for believers in this country, one of the most restricted, one of the most dangerous countries in the world to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Pray for these people. Here's their story. Here's how you can pray. And it will send you a notification to remind you every single day to pray for the extraordinary, that God's name would be made famous in some of the most dangerous places, some of the hardest to share Christianity. So that's just one resource. Um, maybe another thing is, is uh, to just chat with God. It's a simple little acronym. Um, and I don't know. Oh, there we go. Chat with God. So um, confess, confess your sins. So it's kind of the, the Lord's Prayer, just in a different order. It's an acronym, so you can remember. C, confess. God, forgive me of my sins. Honor. God, here's all the things that you are doing, but here's the things that, that, God, please just do these so that you're made famous. Then ask. This is kind of more the, the ordinary things. God, pro provide for my needs. Like, 
God, meet our needs. Um, even kind of blends into the extraordinary of like, God, there's a lot going on in our nation, around the world. So we ask him. But then the last, is, it comes back again to honor. God, thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for who you are. So whatever it is, spend time worshiping God by talking with him. We don't pray so that God loves us. God loves us, so we pray. Um, I'm going to ask Jeff to come out. And, and during this time, just spend time praying. It's simple. That's, that's the take home. Pray. And let it start now, whether it be up front, whether it be at your seat, whether it be as a family, whether it be just with a stranger across the aisle, just pray. Pray together and pray that God's name is honored. So while Jeff plays, I I invite you to, to come and pray, to honor his name and to worship his name, and, and then we'll wrap up with prayer together.